So very quickly, we'll do um, high level overview of clean cities. Um, then we'll go into um, an overview of the Vermont Climate Action Plan and um, the transportation policy gap. Then uh, Michael Pizzifetti from the province of Quebec will give an overview of the Western Climate Initiative. And James Bradbury of uh, the Georgetown Climate Center will give an overview of the transportation, cli transportation and climate initiative program, um, TCIP. <clears throat> Then we'll open up to questions and answers for all panelists. So just very quickly, Clean Cities, it's Department of Energy funded. We work with municipalities, state entities, um, businesses, nonprofits on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, reducing petroleum consumption and um, working across the spectrum of all alternative fuels. Uh, we offer technical assistance, um, high level technical assistance and low level from um, really looking at um, how to integrate uh, alternative fuels into a fleet to lower level um, technologies like idle reduction. The purpose of this um, of this webinar is um, to, to really bring all Vermonters forward on this path. Um, this the task group of the cross sector mitig mitigation subcommittee of the Climate Council and the Climate Council itself is assessing and working to understand the various um, regulatory and policy approaches. Um, so they're exploring options and getting input on key considerations and concerns. Last month they heard about a low carbon fuel standard. This month we're working on TCI and the Western Climate Initiative. So to that end, um, as you hear from our presenters, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat. We will um, address them at the end of the presentations um, because the goal is to start with this common understanding of what these programmatic strategies are and how they might work for Vermont. And now, Jessica, you can take control for me. And I'm going to introduce uh, Megan O'Toole and Colin Smythe. Megan is the Climate Change Mitigation Coordinator at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Colin Smythe is an Environmental Analyst, analyst apologies, at the Department of Enviro Environmental Conservation, where he conducts air pollution emissions inventories, computer modeling, and emission reduction strategies. So Colin and Megan will present on transportation and the Climate Action Plan. Thank you so much, Peggy, and I just want to thank you and Jessica for hosting the webinar and for doing all of the work that goes into um, putting the webinar on today um, and for all the work that you do with Clean City. So thank you very much. Um, so we're going to do just a really brief overview of the work that um, was done related to transportation in the Climate Action Plan by the Vermont Climate Council, and then the work that is ongoing in the transportation sector um, that was called for in the Climate Action Plan. Um, so the, the Climate Action Plan um, did identify a number of pathways and strategies to reduce emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector, um, but did not pinpoint you know, a, a specific suite of regulatory or policy tools that would ensure um, um, certain progress towards our 2030 um, reduction requirements. And um, so that the council directed the cross sector mitigation subcommittee to continue to examine additional transportation policy options and make a recommendation about which policy option or suite of options might be appropriate um, by the end of this year um, for uh, uh, a potential future um, amendment to the climate action plan. So the, the work underway within the transportation task group, which is a task group of the cross sector mitigation subcommittee um, is meant to inform and identify, you know, one or more of these approaches. And so as Peggy highlighted, we have been engaged um, with working through several of these options and then um, highlighting these options with the public via these webinars. We had um, a kind of introductory webinar back in early April, and then the first of our substantive webinars followed by the second one one um, related to um, cap and invest policy options. And then we we continue where we will um, you know continue to engage in these uh, webinars to to continue to inform additional options throughout the summer. 
Um, at the Agency of Natural Resources, we have um, done uh, some degree of, of technical analysis related to a uh, rulemaking package that was included in the Climate Action Plan for ANR to adopt what's called the Advanced Clean Cars 2 program, which regulates passenger cars and light duty trucks. Um, the Advanced Clean Trucks rule, which requires auto manufacturers to deliver for sale a certain percentage of electric medium and heavy duty trucks, and then the medium and heavy duty omnibus rule, which um, addresses uh, more of the criteria pollutants, so like your traditional air pollutants um, for medium and heavy duty engines and trucks. And then there's also another rule incorporated in that that relates directly to greenhouse gas emissions from trucks and then truck trailers as well. So that is all currently happening um, this year, and we plan to adopt those rules before the end of this calendar year. And so we anticipate that there there is a level of reductions that will take place from those rules, and we'll get into that in a few moments. Um, so we do need to conduct further technical analysis on other policies and programs above and beyond those rules, and we're still um, trying to determine what type of funding we might need and then securing that funding to, to do that technical analysis work. Um, so this summer, as I said, we'll be continuing with public engagement in this area. Um, we hope to have further public engagement once we reach um, to or we reach a point where we've identified a preferred option to recommend to the council, and then we will update a proposed recommendation to the climate council, and then hopefully the climate council will deliberate on that recommendation in November. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we are currently adopting the four rules listed here, which I just explained. Um, and we are expecting that we will see uh, you know, a certain amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions from these above rules, but we're still figuring out exactly the uh, what the quantity of reductions will be. Um, we have a pretty good idea of the reductions associated with more of the medium and heavy duty uh, rules, but uh, Advanced Clean Cars 2 was just re recently um, finally proposed by the state of California. And so based on the design of the rule, which we just received, um, we're currently engaging a contractor to do a really robust analysis of the of quantifying the greenhouse gas emission reductions and criteria pollutant emission reductions from the, uh, the Advanced Clean Cars 2 rule specifically. But um, thanks to the good work of Colin and others at ANR and our partners, um, we've been able to identify a preliminary analysis of the re reductions that we're likely to see from Advanced Clean Cars 2. Um, but we do, you know, knowing all of that, we still need to understand, you know, what, what further we will need to do above and beyond these rules. Um, so this preliminary analysis that Colin is going to go over in a moment will explain what we expect to see in emissions reductions um, from Advanced Clean Cars 2 and the other suite of medium, medium and heavy duty rules, um, and then what that gap is that we need to fill with these additional policies um, and program actions. So I'm going to um, turn it over to Colin to go over the, um, the next slide and explain how we arrived at uh, the gap analysis. Great, thank you, Megan. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess kind of following up on where where Megan left us, getting a little bit more uh, into the technical piece of this. Um, so, in order to better understand additional policies or kind of the level of necessary additional policies that we need, we kind of need to know about where we're going to kind of at that point in time. And so we kind of need to have a, a baseline. And um, and so part of determining that, as, as Megan mentioned, was to try to come up with um, to try to come up with an emission reduction ex that we expect to achieve through the adoption of especially ACC2 or Advanced Clean Cars 2. Um, and advanced clean trucks is really what this analysis is focused on. Um, and so to do that, we had um, we had worked on some kind of EV totals that were that will be delivered um, through this regulation to Vermont. And um, I will 
point out that this is just to be delivered to Vermont and not necessarily placed in service. So there is a there's a pretty good assumption in there and obviously a lot of work that needs to go into getting these cars on the road. Um, but that was just an assumption that we need to make for this analysis. Um, but so we were able to project um, kind of the, the number of EVs that we expect to get from this regulation each year. And, um, and then again, with some assumptions, but estimating the amount of greenhouse gas emission reductions we would see if those vehicles offset an uh, internal combustion engine vehicle and were driven kind of the same number of miles, so offsetting a certain amount of gasoline or diesel. Um, and so you, you can see in 2030, which was the focus of this analysis, kind of what we expected with some of the built-in flexibilities in this regulation um, to get in terms of a reduction of a million metric tons of carbon dioxide and number of, of electric vehicles. Um, the other component of this analysis was to kind of to figure out what that remain, remaining gap was. And so in order to do that, like I was kind of saying at the beginning, we need we needed to have kind of a what a let's say business as usual case would be where we kind of expect we might end up in 2030. And that's a really difficult question to answer. But um, but what we came up with for kind of a, a best estimate was to use kind of preliminary 2021 transportation sector emissions estimates and um, which which completed using the same kind of analysis that I do for the greenhouse gas inventory, but it's still preliminary and project that forward, understanding that there are lots of factors pushing and pulling both ways. COVID response kind of bounce back in terms of amount of vehicle miles traveled and but counteracted with kind of additional teleworking and high gas prices and all these EV implementation programs we're hopefully going to put online. Um, but so we figured 2021 levels were were a pretty reasonable estimate because they did drop way off from the latest inventory number we had in 2018. Um, but they had started to rebound a little bit from the low in 2020. So anyway, I won't go into more detail on that right now, but we we kind of flatlined that assumption at the 2021 levels. And when we do that, you kind of get the you get the gap that is the red portion of the bar on the right. And um, the advanced clean cars too and advanced clean trucks reductions are the blue bar below that. And so the red is kind of the remainder of that emissions reductions that we will need to reach our 2030 targets. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to flag again that there's a lot of uncertainty that goes into projecting anything into the future, but this was kind of the, the best and what seemed to be a reasonable estimate that we could come up with. Um, and so I, I think I will leave it there and, um, and yeah, I guess pass it back to you, Peggy. Yes, thank you, Megan and Colin. Um, lots of lots of details um, just in identifying where our gaps are um, here in Vermont. Next, we're going to hear from Michael Pizzi Pizzifetti, the government relations attache to New England for the province of Quebec. He's going to be speaking about the Western Climate Initiative. Um, uh, for over a decade, the um, Quebec has participated in a regional um, economy-wide cap and invest program called the Western Climate Initiative, uh, which is aimed at significantly and strategically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us today to describe how the program works and what it has and continues to deliver for Quebec in terms of climate progress and clean transportation investments and improvements. Thank you, Michael. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peggy. I'm going to try to take control of the uh, presentation that seems to have worked. It's really nice to be with you all this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in Vermont. Um, I'm sitting in Boston at the moment, looking out um, 
what is a pleasant view, but is of 93 South uh, completely backed up already at 1215. I'm not sure where people are going. I don't think the Cape is fully open for business quite yet, although it is going to be a nice weekend. So as Peggy said, I'm, I'm Michael Pizzaferri. I'm the government relations attache with the Quebec government office in Boston, and I lead our climate and energy and transportation policy work in this region. Um, this is what we'll cover today, um, briefly about Quebec and its history with carbon pricing, which is primarily dominated, as Peggy mentioned, over the last decade by the Western Climate Initiative. I'll touch briefly on WCI structure and some of the options that may exist for Vermont as this council continues its deliberations. And then I'll speak about our broader decarbonization efforts, including our 2030 plan for a green economy and what we're doing with the important side of the cap and invest model, which is the invest piece of all of this. I'll start because I do think it's helpful, although folks in Vermont are much more familiar with Quebec than uh, than most of the US, just to situate us within the North American context. Um, Quebec has about eight and a half million people, roughly the same size as New York City, but the land area, of course, is enormous. We're two and a half times larger than Texas. And for those of you that have been fortunate enough to travel north of Montreal and into the wilderness of the province, you can see immediately why we're home to about 3% of the world's freshwater reserves. All of that uh, does allow us to produce electricity that is clean. 99.8% of the electricity produced in Quebec is clean. Most of that is hydro, which is also supporting Vermont's renewable energy goals. Um, and we do have a carbon neutrality goal by 2050. So sharing that, uh, that objective with many states in the Northeast. And an important note that I think we all share in New England and Quebec shares as well, is that electrification and decarbonization and carbon neutrality is of course an imperative for the climate, but it's also for us an economic imperative. We spend eight and a half billion Canadian dollars every single year to import fossil fuels into Quebec, which is 50% of our emissions, mostly from transportation. And it's also 57% of our trade deficit with the rest of the world. And Quebec and Canada as a whole are trade dependent economies. 70% of our trade goes to the US. So when we look at that trade deficit number, this is also about an economic imperative for us. And electrification, given our hydroelectric resources, has been the immediate place that we look to to do that. Um, and in this region, why we have an office in Boston is because Quebec has more American neighbors than it does Canadian ones. We share a border with four states in the Northeast, including Vermont, of course, and we share some significant land, water, and air resources, including Lake Champlain, which in a couple of weeks, actually, we're, we'll hopefully be up in Vermont to renew our agreement with New York, Vermont, and Quebec uh, to protect that watershed and the basin. So this timeline gives you a little bit of the history uh, with carbon pricing in Quebec, so I'll dive right into that. It actually begins slightly before this timeline begins. I didn't have a handy graphic that included the 2006 figure. Um, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the world to place a levy in a, above and beyond a gas tax, a levy on fossil fuels in 2006, um, one of the first places in the world to do so, and I believe one of the first places certainly in North America as well. But we quickly realized uh, upon imposing that cap, which did generate significant revenue to be reinvested back into the transportation system that that wasn't quite comprehensive enough. It wasn't a comprehensive enough tool to meet what at the time uh, and continue to be our ambitious uh, climate goals and decarbonization goals. So in 2008, Quebec alongside California, um, as well as Ontario, British Columbia, and a few other jurisdictions in North America developed the Western Climate Initiative, which I'll refer to from here probably interchangeably as our carbon market, WCI, um, and cap and trade. So if, if that gets confusing at any point, just flag it for me, but I'll probably use those three terms interchangeably. And WCI is, is a nonprofit organization that provides the administrative and technical services to support the implementation of a cap and trade system. So in order for 
the regional greenhouse gas initiative to function as an example you have reggie inc which is managing the auctions uh, we did the same thing and we still do the same thing with wci inc which manages our auctions as well um, and continues to do so so along with california and those other jurisdictions as i mentioned from 2008 to about 2013 we worked with uh, experts all across north america as part of wci to develop what turned into our cap and trade or cap and invest system um, and our system began operating in january of 2013 and then in 2014, so one year after this initial independent operation, we were officially and formally linked with California. Um, and so today, the Western Climate Initiative uh, includes Quebec and California. It also includes um, the province of Nova Scotia, which operates um, a little bit independently from our system. So Quebec and California have a joint auction um, with our two, uh, our two jurisdictions and our laws and regulations according to the cap and invest model are harmonized across that. And so it is today the only, uh, it is the largest carbon market in North America, uh, California, of course, population larger than Canada as a whole and eight and a half million people in, in Quebec do make it the largest carbon market in our continent and it's also the only carbon market in the world that is operated by two subnational governments in two different countries um, and nova scotia which is an interesting example i i as a representative of quebec can't speak too closely to them uh, but is a really interesting example for vermont because they're a much smaller province uh, maritime province in eastern canada a uh, population about a million so it's a little bit bigger than than vermont and and they decided to establish their own uh, cap and trade system to comply with Canadian laws related to carbon pricing, putting a price on carbon at the federal level. Uh, in 2018, Nova Scotia decided that the Western Climate Initiative and a cap and trade system was the right model for them. They began trading independently uh, auction credits in January of 2019, and they continue to uh, manage a separate auction for their emitters within Nova Scotia, but they utilize the tools and administrative services of WCI, which have been perfected. Uh, I can't say they're perfect, that have been working a work in progress towards perfection uh, since 2008 and officially in function since uh, since 2013. You know why the question that sort of always comes up and I'm happy to dive into this uh, in the question and answer period is what motivated Quebec's choice for a cap and trade system versus I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion on the Climate Council about a carbon tax, which is another model that's pursued by provinces in Canada, including British Columbia. Um, and we felt really the primary reason for the cap and trade system is its flexibility. I, I think that term is, is key because it allows us to, first of all, set this cap so that we know where emissions are headed and how high they can go, and we can continue to progressively reduce that cap. So it is the most guaranteed way of reducing emissions from, uh, from a government perspective, but it does also allow for that flexibility. And it does that in part by sending this price signal, um, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more, but by sending a strong carbon price signal to a very wide range of economic stakeholders and allowing them to determine the best way for themselves to reduce their emissions. And the revenue that is generated by the cap and trade system is returned back into the economy in the form of complementary policies that themselves seek to reduce emissions. So rather than a, a carbon tax model that seeks to be revenue neutral and, and perhaps return funding, uh, which has seen some success in North America as well, uh, rather than that, we take all revenue from the cap and trade system and reinvest it back into complementary policies uh, to allow us to further reduce emissions. And I mentioned at the top just how dependent our economy is on trade and the cap and trade system as a tool um, is flexible for governments to 
select certain carve outs for industries that may not be ready um, to participate in the auction that may not be able to participate in the additional costs that are associated with this. Um, and so there are some export intensive industries in Quebec that are carved out. But today, uh, WCI covers 85% of our economy total. Uh, that does not include, as I said, export, uh, a few very specific export related industries. Um, or agriculture, but investments do go back, uh, which I think is the key. The investments that are generated by the other 85% of the economy uh, do go back to help those, uh, including agriculture industries, continue themselves to decarbonize. So where we generate all of this funding um, is used to be called the Green Fund, uh, is now called the Electrification and Climate Change Fund, which is a government run fund where every cent of the revenue generated from the carbon market is deposited into the FECC, which is the French acronym. Um, in 23rd, from the 2013 to 2020 period, which is when our carbon market began operating uh, for the first seven years, that generated 4.3 billion uh, dollars to be reinvested, Canadian dollars to be reinvested back into the economy. And that now, um, as, I'll, as I'll get into, is largely funding our 2030 plan for a green economy. And two thirds of that investment, this has been the case basically from the outset of the cap and trade system being put in place in 2013, two thirds of that revenue is invested back into transportation. Um, and so, which is our largest source of emissions, our power sector is clean, of course, and so focusing our efforts and our investment on, on transportation and getting carbon out of that system was really pretty essential for us from the beginning. And we have seen um, some significant results to date. As you all know, the lag in climate data is quite slow, so the latest numbers uh, with this type of graph that I was able to get for you uh, are from 2017. We're usually that kind of backlog, unfortunately. 8.7% um, total reduction in emissions uh, between 1990 and 2017, uh, which is uh, roughly, you know, from 2013, the start of this really intensive investment. Um, and during that same period, which is a theme I'll keep returning to, our economy grew quite significantly and our population grew as well. And all of that means that today, Quebec has one of the lowest carbon intensive economies per capita, uh, really anywhere in the world, but certainly in North America. And transportation is one big source of our emissions. And you can see that we're, we're struggling. And, and you know this isn't a, a presentation just to tell you that everything is great. Uh, you know, 50 miles north of Burlington, uh, we have our challenges as well, and we're continuing to to tweak the system, tweak our investments to ensure that that number here, transportation, uh, will decline when our next uh, emissions reports come out. But you can see that some sectors that are otherwise quite hard, uh, including buildings and industry um, and waste, have, have seen this significant reduction in emissions. For WCI uh, in advance of this conversation, um, and I know he offered as well that he'd be happy to speak to the Climate Council if that's of interest, Greg Tamblin, who is the Executive Director of WCI Inc. Uh, based in Sacramento, California, managing the structure and auction market of, of uh, the Western Climate Initiative. Uh, visited Vermont in 2019 and had some really interesting conversations with folks at the state house and, and across the state, including NGOs. And uh, shout out to the Energy Action Network who helped organize his visit back then. Um, Greg shared with me that WCI Inc. continues to be open to new jurisdictions uh, joining the partnership. It's something that is is open and something that they're ready to do in the same way that they brought on uh, Nova Scotia in the last few years. Um, and we're also, I will say, Quebec is always ready to support. That's why I'm on this call today uh, with our technical expertise and, and, and sharing of best practices and also learning from, from the way that Vermont is approaching these, these common challenges. Um, the services 
that WCI Inc. provides can be quite beneficial, especially for smaller states and provinces, which was one of the factors leading to um, leading to Nova Scotia joining. Um, and that piece of this allows um, allows them to do all of this, hopefully a little bit more cost effective. So the last few minutes or so that I have of the presentation, I'll just kind of run through briefly of our current plan. Uh, because I think it's one thing to talk about the cap and and the invest model and how that how that functions in the province and the revenue that it's generated. Um, but we do feel strongly that unless we are investing it back into the economy, uh, we will not see the gains with the cap alone. Um, and so just a few weeks ago, so this conversation uh, is well timed from that perspective. We unveiled our 2022, so our next five year action plan for investments in decarbonization and our plan for a green economy. Uh, that will hopefully represent about $7.6 billion in total investment across all of the main sectors. But as you can see right there, about half of that investment will be dedicated once again to transportation, which continues to be our most difficult sector to decarbonize. Uh, one and a half billion almost for industrial uh, sector processes, 750 million for buildings. Uh, most of that funding does come from, again, we're anticipating from revenues generated by the carbon market, which if I didn't say this at the beginning is important, that is done at the um, supplier level. So the simplest example to understand is when fuel is imported into the province, as I mentioned, we do not uh, produce oil and gas in, in Quebec. When fuel is imported into the province, those distributors are the ones that are paying this, uh, that are paying for the auction allowance in order to keep distributing fuel in Quebec. Um, and so that's where the money is generated. Um, the elephant in the room that, of course, always comes up with this um, is the price of gas. I think you probably, anybody that lives north uh, in northern Vermont certainly knows that there's a lot of Quebecers that are, are when the border is a little bit more fluid, traveling south to, um, to fill up their cars. Um, obviously, right now, we're in a very volatile situation globally, uh, and so we hope that the gas prices that we're currently seeing are perhaps uh, temporary, uh, but this time last year, uh, gas in Quebec worked out to be about $3.80 a gallon, and right now it is, it's it's about $5.50 a gallon, so it's it's similar in price to what, what folks in California are paying. That's about just under two Canadian dollars a liter. Um, so it is it is significant, but it's not as as large of a gap as I think sometimes our rhetoric uh, can can seem. Um, our goals very similar to those of uh, of Vermont. We seek to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Our 2030 goal is 37 and a half percent below 1990 levels. Um, and then diving into this piece, the 1.6 million electric vehicles on the road uh, in Quebec by 2030. Um, I think is a key part of this and happy to talk about that a little bit more closely. Um, right now we have seen uh, the total emissions from the transportation transportation sector have been tough, but we have seen significant growth in our transportation electrification. We are home to uh, about 50% of Canada's EVs are in the on the roads in Quebec, uh, which is over 130,000 EVs. So we met our, our 2020 target of 100,000. And just uh, the number that I saw fairly recently stayed with a similar population to Quebec is Massachusetts. I believe there's less than 20,000 EVs on the road in Massachusetts. So we've seen a significant market share. And this is, of course, none of this is possible if we were only getting people that lived in Montreal to transition to EVs. This map shows uh, includes parts of northern New England, but it does show the distribution of charging stations across the province. Uh, you know, heavy concentration in Montreal um, and in Quebec City, but you can see that there is significant investment all the way out on the Gas Bay Peninsula, um, places that are much more rural, uh, look a lot more like parts of, uh, you know, the rural United States as well. Um, and, you know, you can't just incentivize the person to buy a car. Um, you also have to figure out a way for them to charge it and ideally maybe even charge it at work. And we also 
do not just incentivize those that are privileged enough to purchase new vehicles. There is a rebate available for um, used electric vehicles as well. And a piece to touch on that I think is essential and happy to answer this and some of the questions as well is we're not giving up uh, trucks or, or or buses or or even snowmobiles. Uh, we want to make them uh, we want to make them electric and we want to make them better for the environment. And we do produce um, all kinds of electric vehicles except for passenger cars in Quebec. Taiga Motors uh, launched back in 2021 with an initial $100 million funding round and debuted uh, in Vermont in the US market in March of this year uh, with Governor Scott, and that's our delegate to New England, uh, taking a ride. Lion Electric is another company people may have heard about, uh, one of North America's largest EV school bus manufacturers. There's Nova Bus, there's charging stations. So we're seeing a real growth in the number of jobs that are available in this uh, in this market and climate tech as a whole has generated about 45,000 new jobs in our clean tech sector. And I think I am out of time, so I will stop, but I'm happy to speak about the workforce challenge and opportunity with all of this um, in uh, transition into this new economy and why these investments have made some of that possible. So thank you all and, and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was a great explanation of the Western Climate Initiative in, um, I think, really digestible terms. I appreciate that. Um, next up, we have James Bradbury. He's the Mitigation Program Director for the Georgetown Climate Center. He oversees the Climate Center's work on reducing emissions from all sectors. Um, this includes the Climate Center Climate Center's work on the power sector, supporting state leadership, and coordinating engagement with the federal government through um, facilitation, convening, and analysis. James also manages um, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, TCI, a collaboration among 12 Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states in the District of Columbia to reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Thank you, James, for joining us today and giving us an update on where TCIP stands um, and what the program has been designed to deliver if it were to advance. All right, James, thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this invitation to present to the Vermont Climate Council. It's really an honor to be here. As Peggy mentioned, I'm James Bradbury, and the purpose of my talk is to introduce you to TCIP, or the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program. In brief, TCIP was designed as a multi-state program that sets a mandatory cap on carbon emissions from transportation, similar to WCI and the cap there. Uh, for Vermont, it could also generate over $2 million annually to enable investments that give people and businesses in the state more affordable, clean transportation options. So, and as I'll explain, TCIP is a ready to go policy option that's available whenever states decide to advance it. And my presentation will start with a brief introduction to my organization, the Georgetown Climate Center. And next, I'll describe the TCIP uh, program goals and some background and context for that. Uh, I'll explain how the cap and invest program would work, and then I'll describe some of the benefits that are expected to result from TCIP, and importantly, how the program was designed to center equity when it's implemented so as to ensure that a substantial portion of the benefits are realized by populations that are currently disadvantaged by the transportation system. And I'll finish with a couple words about the building blocks of the program to help explain how the different you know, pieces would fit together in practice should Vermont choose to implement the program. And of course, I'm looking forward to the discussion and questions at the end. So next slide, please. So for those who aren't familiar, I want to briefly introduce the Georgetown Climate Center. So we are based at Georgetown University Law Center, and we were launched in 2009 to support state climate action. We work across several climate policy areas, including helping states reduce emissions from power and transportation sectors. We work to inform federal policies with lessons from the states, and we work across all levels of government to increase resilience to the impacts of climate change. 
We've also spent many years working with state agencies in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region to support the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which we help to facilitate on behalf of the participating jurisdictions. And in our role as facilitators, we support the states by conducting technical analysis and research, facilitating calls and meetings, also helping the states to conduct stakeholder outreach and public engagement through events like webinars and, and, and workshops. Next slide, please. And before I get into the detailed descriptions of TCIP, I think it's fitting to start with the program's goals, which are shown on this slide, because really these goals are critical to understanding what TCI is about, TCIP is about. Um, so these are the goals that the states have set for themselves through this process, initially outlined kind of at a, at a higher level in 2018 at the start of a regional process that led to where we are today. And then these goals were articulated um, and they're paraphrased slightly here in the final memorandum of understanding or, or MOU, which was signed by a subset of the regional regional jurisdictions at the end of 2020. And I'll get more to that in a second. But regarding the program goals, the first four of these are really, you know, no surprise. We want, you know, reducing emissions from transportation, providing and, and really providing the other benefits that come along with low carbon transportation and investments in infrastructure and setting up a new regional program. Um, and the fifth goal is really the important one I want to elaborate on later in my presentation, and that is to advance equity for communities overburdened by pollution and underserved by the transportation system. There are a number of ways in which uh, this was intended to, um, sorry, the program was designed to, to achieve those goals. Next slide, please. So first and originally TCI was created in 2010 through an agreement among states to establish a regional forum for collaboration between state energy, environment and transportation agencies. It, this now this initiative now includes all 14 jurisdictions shown on this map from North Carolina to Maine and including my home here, Washington, D.C. Since 2010, TCI has been and continues to be a forum for states to coordinate on a range of transportation issues, including EV infrastructure deployment. Um, for a while, we were helping states address barriers to accessing real time traffic data to inform policy and and uh, consumer choice and generally learning from each other's low carbon transportation efforts. That's what TCI has always been about. TCI was also has also been the forum through which the Transportation and Climate Initiative Program, or TCIP, was developed. So there's a little distinction I'm making with the graphics on this, or with the, the words on these slides, this slide, I wanted to clarify that. Um, of course, TCIP is a multi-state cap and invest program that has been developed over fewer years, about beginning in 2018. Um, TCI has been around since 2010. TCIP really started its development process in 2018. And the jurisdictions involved with developing TCIP are shown in this slide in the two different colors of blue. So all the jurisdictions other than than two of the TCI jurisdictions have been involved in the development of TCIP. An important aspect of TCIP that is is that you know by design it recognizes the value of regional collaboration. It, it takes a regional approach to tackle the regional problem of modernizing transportation systems, particularly in a region with so many um relatively small states with interconnected transportation systems so as noted a moment ago um, in december 2020 the governors of three states and the mayor of washington dc those of course are the dark blue jurisdictions on this map they signed an mou agreeing to become charter members of tcip signaling their intention to move forward their intention at the time to move forward with implementing the program Meanwhile, at the same time, the eight other jurisdictions, including Vermont, agreed to remain at the table to help do the additional work of designing a program, in this case, the TCI program, in a way that would enable any state in the region to implement it whenever they were ready to do so. So in terms of the status of TCIP, um, I just want to be really clear that while no jurisdictions are currently implementing it at this time, the program is ready and available for whenever states are ready to advance it. So now on to the question of how would TCIP work? And that's the next slide, please. So the 
The first feature to highlight is the cap on carbon pollution from on road transportation, and that declines over time. As shown on this graph, the modeling that was conducted to inform program design projected that the program would cut emissions by at least 26% in participating jurisdictions from 2022 to 2032. And since this is a cap and invest program, the cap works in concert with the clean transportation investments, as well as other policies, of course, as well. Next slide, please. So from an administrative and, and legal standpoint, the cap applies to carbon dioxide emissions from the transportation fuels sold by wholesale suppliers to distributors who deliver it in trucks to fueling stations and in, in participating jurisdictions. This means that the point of compliance is typically at these fuel terminals, like the one shown in this photo here, which is where fuels from tanks are dispensed across a terminal rack into trucks. So it's these fuel suppliers who would need to hold allowances for the pollution from the fuel that they sell. This I think is somewhat similar to the, the to uh, WCI that Michael described earlier. And, and so for one pollution allowance, is needed for each ton of carbon dioxide emitted by those fuels that are sold. And this approach works because we know that there's a very clear paper trail for all of the fuels that are sold to distributors from the companies that own the fuel stored at these terminal facilities, like the one on the slide. Um, the last point I'll make at this here is that the fuel suppliers can purchase the allowances that they need at quarterly auctions. Um, or from others who may have more allowances than they need. And the auctions are a straightforward mechanism to set a regional price for allowances. And, and this actually is beneficial for a multi-state program because it ensures equal program costs for all participating states. So there's, there's equity in that sense across jurisdictions participating. Next slide, please. And then, of course, as with WCI, by selling emission allowances through auctions to fuel distributors, participating jurisdictions generate proceeds that can be invested in more affordable, clean transportation choices. And, and that's one of the fundamental goals, of course. So number four, sort of point number four of how TCIP would work is really the invest part of cap and invest. And for Vermont, um, TCIP is expected, would be expected to generate over $20 million annually for clean transportation investments. And an important aspect of TCIP design is that each jurisdiction would have discretion in this regard, how to spend the dollars. Every state's different and would make its own investment decisions with input from the public, um, as I'll discuss a bit more later. So additionally, to achieve TCIP equity goals, investment strategies would need to be scoped and implemented in ways that really deliver benefits to um, to overburdened and underserved communities. Again, I'll get to that in a, in a couple slides here. The good news is, as may be apparent, is that many of the things we can do to reduce uh, greenhouse gas pollution from transportation also deliver major benefits to public health and, and to the economy. For example, in both cities and in rural areas, lower income communities often have less access to clean transportation choices than other communities. So the opportunity to address pollution is also an opportunity to address equity of access, making it easier for people to travel to work, school and you know, healthcare services and, and to build, build communities that are more connected and vibrant. Um, also, of course, investing in low carbon solutions presents an opportunity to achieve other policy goals like job creation. And it's really, of course, up to each state which additional goals they would like to achieve through these investments. Um, but there are a lot of win-win opportunities associated with cutting our dependence on petroleum-based transportation fuels and uh, investing in low carbon alternatives. Um, and to name one of the more important ones, in the next slide, please, public health. Public health is really a very important benefit of low carbon transportation, and I'll just take a moment to highlight that here. So using outputs from the TCIP modeling that was conducted, there was independent work by a Harvard-led consortium of academic researchers to estimate the potential scale of public health benefits associated with implementing the program. And what they found was that the steps taken to cut carbon dioxide emissions from transportation can provide a range of co-benefits, health-related co-benefits that really come from three main factors. So first, 
Reductions in the particulate matter and other pollution from cars and trucks can significantly improve air quality. And this accounts for about a third of the projected 350 premature deaths avoided and thousands fewer incidents of childhood asthma expected to result from, from the program. Two, uh, you know, the second the second factor is giving people more transportation options helps to reduce traffic congestion, and this generally makes streets safer for pedestrians. So this accounts for over 30 lives saved and hundreds of major injuries avoided. And then third, um, when it's safer pe for people to walk and bike and transit services are improved, people can take advantage of those. People tend to take advantage of those options, and that, and that means more people experience the health benefits of physical activity. So this accounts for the remainder of the total avoided deaths and all told the monetized annual health benefits are projected to be over 3.6 billion dollars in 2032 which is considerably more than the total level of annual PCIP investments so on balance a, a net benefit just looking at the public health benefits alone um, and I want to be really clear these numbers assume that all states in the across the region participate and of course the benefits would be proportionally less when you're looking at just individual jurisdictions we didn't do modeling for each jurisdiction in the region um, and, and neither did did trek uh, the research group that I'm um, highlighting here but happy to answer questions about how that might scale uh, for for Vermont okay next slide please in addition to the health benefits, I wanted to point to some of the potential economic and employment related benefits. So overall, TCIP is projected to have a modest but net positive impact on GDP, income and jobs. This was a robust conclusion from our research as it was true for all of the cap reduction and investment scenarios that we modeled uh, for TCIP. So and I, and I and I want to emphasize when I say the benefits are modest. I use that word modest. And, and the main reason is because the program is actually not very large compared to the size of the economy. We're talking about across the region, $2 billion of investment annually. The regional GDP is over $6 trillion. So while annual, so, so that's just to give you a sense. That's why I'm using the term modest here. Uh, I don't want to overstate um, the benefits. While they're substantial, there's a scale point I want to make. <laughs> Um, of course, the program also has costs, as Michael pointed out um, correctly, of course. So in addition to the projected health and economic benefits, TCIP and analysis also accounted for expected costs of emission allowances, which are projected to start at uh, just six and a half dollars a ton. So six dollars and fifty cents uh, per ton in 2023. And so the cost of purchasing allowances, as with WCI, would be incurred by the regulated fuel suppliers. Um, and as I explained, the, they're the ones who need to hold allowances for compliance. And they have said publicly that they would pass on those costs to consumers. And, and at six fifty dollars a ton, um, that's about five cents per gallon at the pump. And that's for the would, would be the estimated impact of the pump in the first year. In the end, all told, again, the benefits of the program are projected to be significantly uh, greater than the costs and net with net positive benefit expected to grow over time. And I'll just make a just I want to unpack that a little bit. So this is really I want to help people understand why this is so because businesses and individuals are saving money in in this sort of in in, in, a, in a world where there's more low carbon transportation options. A big factor is reducing overall fuel expenditures. It is no secret that gas and diesel are expensive and even more so quite a bit more so now than when we did this modeling. So the net benefits would be considerably even more positive in a world with the high kind of high gas prices we see today. Um, people also save more money from spending less time in traffic. And so you can quantify the benefits of that for businesses. Um, we didn't account for the benefits to individuals. So if you're on your own time spending less time in traffic, that's a great benefit to your quality of life. But we didn't even actually account for that in the modeling. Um, finally, people save money by spending less on vehicle operations and maintenance. And, and that's really captured by as more people and consumers are driving electric vehicles. That's cheaper to maintain and the fuels are, are, are cheaper as well. Electricity is cheaper than gas and diesel. So the bottom line is that TCIP could spur economic growth and, and, and also help states achieve their climate goals. OK, just uh, just two more slides to, to wrap up. Um, 
the next I just want to cover, as I promised, a few of the ways that TCIP was designed to center equity. And these design features were informed by a lot of public engagement and input at public workshops and through thousands of online submissions in the TCI public input portal. Many stakeholders and particularly environmental justice advocates have been really clear since the beginning of this concept of setting up a regional program in 2018, you know, since that surfaced, that transportation systems currently as they stand are inequitable and that any policy solutions, TCIP or otherwise, must directly address the needs of disadvantaged communities. And, and uh, I think the TCIP jurisdictions were really responsive to that and tried to find many ways to be responsive. And, and, and the first, in, in, in ways, of, in a couple different ways I'll highlight here, kind of ways of centering equity and program implementation. Um, and these are reflected in the final memorandum of understanding and also in the model rule that was published uh, just under a year ago, last June. So first, at a minimum, 35% of the proceeds would be targeted toward investments that benefit overburdened and underserved communities. So states could, of course, would be free to direct more than 35% to this purpose, but that's the minimum. Second, equitable proceed, uh, sorry, equitable processes would ensure that communities can provide meaningful input into decision making. And I'll give you a couple examples. For one, as noted on the slide here, each state would create equity advisory bodies made up of a diverse stakeholder groups with a majority representing overburdened and underserved communities to advise on TCIP decision making. Um, and an explicit role for the equity advisory bodies is to help define overburdened and underserved communities, which could have a different meaning in, in different states, and particularly a rural state like Vermont, that might look different than a neighboring state with larger ur urban populations, for example. Similarly, equity advisory bodies would identify metrics for evaluating progress with respect to TCIP goals and make recommendations as to which metrics the states should be should be tracking over time. Again, for a state like Vermont, this could be tailored to meet the unique needs of all communities, including rural residents like rural residents. Do they have a, an affordable pathway when they want to buy a new or used vehicle to replacing their vehicle with an electric vehicle? How is that being tracked? How successful are those efforts going? That could be a metric that could be developed for um, and, and reported on on a regular basis. And then in third, in the interest of transparency, implementation plans, which I'll talk about in a moment, the, their implementation plans would be published by each jurisdiction, along with annual reporting on the equity impacts of the program. Um, so this would include air quality monitoring, for example, to help evaluate public health risks for overburdened communities. Finally, there's a really a clear understanding at this point that each jurisdiction would need to pursue a broad range of low carbon transportation strategies. We heard um, you know, Megan and Colin at the beginning of this call referring to some of those, what those strategies um, are currently under, under uh, in, in the works in Vermont. So for example, this includes air quality monitoring, um, which I mentioned, uh, vehicle emission standards to uh, get more, ensure there are more electric vehicles on the road and it, available for consumers, as I think Megan explained. Um, and it also could include port electrification initiatives, for example. Several states are pursuing those those types of programs, and those could be could use TCIP funding, but also other sources of funding as well. Um, all right, so next and final slide. And with this final slide, I just want to highlight three documents that uh, represent really building blocks for implementation. And and there are and they're all they're all available on the TCIP website. The link is here at the bottom of the slide. The first building block is the model implementation plan, which is essentially a template that describes at a high level the various stages and processes for implementation. So each state that chooses to implement TCIP would then populate this template with the details of how that state plans to advance the climate and equity and other goals of the program through various steps of the implementation process. The second document is the model rule, which really is a common regulatory framework that's necessary to ensure that each participating jurisdiction uses consistent approaches to regulating and enforcing a declining cap on carbon emissions covered by the program. This is critical to have a functioning carbon market, is to have common regulations that apply to the fuel providers. 
And then finally, the third document is a framework for public engagement, which outlines several key principles that participating jurisdictions would follow during the program implementation, specifically related to public engagement and meaningful public engagement. So, for example, taking steps to make sure public participation is accessible to everyone. Uh, to address any language barriers, ensure disability access, that sort of thing. Also, another example it would be investing in capacity building for, consume, for for communities to ensure that all stakeholders have the resources that they need to need to provide meaningful input uh, to TCIP. And finally, with that, I will I'll close just by emphasizing really the importance of this moment and. Recognizing that cutting emissions at the scale and speed needed to confront the threats of climate change requires concerted and coordinated action. And that coordinated action is one of the hardest parts. So again, while no jurisdictions are actively pursuing TCIP, the program is ready and available and designed for when individual and, and ideally multiple states are re ready to advance it. And, and this uncertainty around which states would join and when is why TCIP was designed to give jurisdictions across the region flexibility in terms of the timing of when they join and their pathways to implementation. So some uniformity is required to make the market work, but the building blocks also allow a lot of flexibility by design. And I will close there. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Um, I appreciate you linking um, transportation equity and health into this conversation, um, you know, reminding us that that's also at the fore, in, in, including reducing emissions. Um, so I want to thank our presenters, um, Megan, Colin, Michael, and James. So Megan um, and Colin, if you could put your, um, your cameras on, we're going to start diving into some questions. There are some questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to also ask um, Jane Lazorchek, who is the Global Warming Solutions Act Project Director at the Agency of Natural Resources. She will help me with um, facilitating the, the Q&A. Um, we have some in the chat, and then if you want to um, uh, raise your hand, you can do that as well. So Jane, do you want to start tackling the ones in the chat first? Sure. Um, thanks, Peggy. I think that um, the only question that I currently see. Oh, wait, there's two actually. Sorry. Um, the first one is really directed to Michael. It says, does Quebec's transportation funding include provisions for vehicle grid integration and V2G? Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd, I'd have to look into the plan to see if that was specifically funded. What I can share is Lion Electric, which is one of the companies I discussed is exploring the V to G application of their products, especially because a school bus uh, will be spending a lot of time sitting next to, in theory, a building. Um, they participated at Renewable Energy Vermont and fingers crossed, I, th I think they'll be there again next year um, to discuss that. So it is, it is certainly part of the conversation in Quebec. I'm not sure that there's specific funding for those applications at this point. Thanks. I, I should highlight that um, a, there was an earlier question before Steve's um, from a guest that asked about um, just how green is Hydro Quebec and has a full life cycle analysis been done for Hydro Quebec? And I'd actually be interested, in, Michael, if you have a if Quebec has done anything on your own, but did respond to them in the chat that Vermont is about to undergo our own life cycle analysis of our energy use, and that will be included in ours. But we'd be interested in hearing if Quebec has done anything already that we can be learning from too. Yes, yeah, certainly, and happy to connect offline as well with anybody. Hydro Quebec does regularly conduct uh, full life cycle analysis analyses of their emissions and total emissions. And if ANR and the public utilities folks are not don't have that information, I'm sure they would be happy to share it. Um, I do not represent Hydro Quebec, so I don't want to misrepresent them, but I will put a link in the chat to their website, which does describe some of this life cycle analysis and, you know, compares in particular the fact that a hydro reservoir of which they're um, the ones that are supplying Vermont, of course, are already constructed, can be in operation for 
up to a century. And so looking at the life cycle of that resource compared to uh, smaller scale renewables has to take into account the uh, production of, say, a solar panel as one example or a wind turbine. Um, and typically our emissions do end up looking somewhere like wind. So we, I can share that. I'll, I'll drop that link in the chat and I'm happy to continue the conversation always and connect you with folks at, at Hydro directly. Thank you so much. Um, Becky Jones asked a question uh, largely directed to you, James, I believe, but it says, have you included in your calculations the amount of carbon that building 230,000 new electric cars would generate? We, our analysis actually does not include that sort of life cycle assessment of the, of, uh, um, on the, you know, vehicles themselves. And so I guess if the counterfactual is reducing purchasing uh, internal combustion engine vehicles, then, you know, I think they're fairly comparable, uh, but I am not an expert on that. So I think you would need to, and it's possible some other folks on the phone are more familiar with life cycle uh, emissions associated with electric vehicle manufacturing versus conventional ICE vehicles, internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, but that was not accounted for in our modeling. What, what I will just comment on is, you know, I think maybe the spirit of the question recognizes that um, electric vehicles may not be the whole answer. Uh, in a rural state like Vermont, there are not a lot of options for, for people who rely on their car to get do everything they need to do, get to school, uh, get their kids to school, get to the store, get to work and all that. Um, uh, but for certainly areas that are more urban and suburban, I think land use decisions are important and investments in public transportation and making it not everybody's going to want to walk and bike, but those who want to walk and bike should be able to without fear or fearing for their lives, in my opinion. <laughs> so I think that sort of infrastructure and land use decisions that enables people to choose active mobility take transit and make those services available for more people is also really important. Yeah, and I, just to add on to that, I, I will say that in Vermont's Climate Action Plan, um, our transportation pathways to help us uh, cut our emissions are multifaceted and um, do look at compact settlement, um, look at reducing vehicle miles traveled as a result, think about smaller micro transit, multimodal use, bike ped. So we are looking at the full spectrum, understanding the co-benefits and quality of life also associated with the other components that you were just speaking to. Um, I jump in quickly to preempt it because it's right off of that same point a question from joe in the chat about our transportation strategies but that's true in quebec as well we we fund in addition to the um the ev chargers that i mentioned the subsidies to purchase an electric vehicle the essential criteria to receive funding from the plan for a green economy is that you can show a reduction in carbon emissions. And so in order to achieve buy-in for a province as large as Quebec, especially from those representing in the National Assembly, folks from Gaspé that may never take the metro in Montreal, uh, there needed to be funding for those communities. And that continues to be the case. And that can include, um, as James was just saying, you know, bike and cycle infrastructure can include pedestrian infrastructure. The essential component is that it reduces carbon emissions. Um, and we do track those. And, and the slide that I included demonstrated that, unfortunately, our, our transportation emissions did go up slightly as a result of, of more people on the road. Um, but our overall emissions has declined. Um, so we do track that very closely. It's great. I, I will say, Councillor, uh, we're joined by a couple of councillors in the chat and Councillor Jared Duval just put an interesting analysis um, in the chat that speaks to the previous question about life cycle analysis of an EV versus an internal combustion engine. I just want to go back up before I lose it. Another councillor, um, Richard Cower, asked a question um, of you too, Michael, in uh, Western Climate Initiative, what has been the auction price per ton of carbon and what has been the impact on price per gallon on the transportation fuels? Certainly. So the current clearing price in the most recent auction, which I believe was in February of 2022, was $29.15 uh, US, US dollars. Um, so that's a little bit more than double uh, what Reggie's auction price, which I believe is about 13 50 right now. Somebody else knows that 
better than I do, please correct me. Um, so we're looking at approaching $30 uh, per ton of carbon uh, per auction. Nova Scotia, as I mentioned, is operating slightly independently, has a price that's a little bit more in line with Reggie totals. They're at $21 Canadian, which on my rough estimate is maybe about 17 US dollars. So that's the price that they're looking at. And they have 19, which I, I wanted to mention this and I think I forgot. They have 19 auction participants, which may look something similar to what Vermont would have in terms of auction participants that actually meet the threshold required of emissions uh, in order to, to bid within this type of auction. Um, and for the second part of the question, the impact on the price per gallon, I would have to do a little bit more research to get you that information. There's a mix of, of gasoline taxes that function similar to what we're familiar with in the US. Um, and then this is an indirect uh, impact similar to how TCI would be. This is an indirect increase in the price uh, for the supply of gasoline in the province. And so I'd have to do a little bit more research, but happy to connect about that. Great, thank you. Um, we have another counselor, Sue Minter, um, is asking, can you describe some of the strategies for increasing EV purchases and use in Quebec? How did you succeed in such a strong transition? Sure, yeah, I will. Um, don't mind me as I pull up my notes. I just don't want to, I don't want to misquote anything. Um, a major part of this is that since I believe at least since 2014, we have been funding uh, the EV subsidies, which now for the purchase of a new electric vehicle are at $7,000 uh, and for a used electric vehicle are at 3,500. We also include incentives for, um, for home charging. But what I think was essential, and I know that this is part of the conversation in Vermont because we have been participating in this as well, is the concept of both range anxiety as well as familiarity with the technology and electric circuit which is a subsidiary of hydro quebec so our utility really was at the forefront of expanding ev infrastructure everywhere in quebec uh, and this was before it was profitable for them to be doing so. This was funded primarily from proceeds from the carbon market, and they're now looking at, I believe the latest numbers I saw approaching 3000 EV chargers that are on the electric circuit network. And that was essential for people you know, as a psychological question in making this transition. If they knew that Hydro Quebec electric circuit was gonna be building this charger, it was visible for them. There was a level of comfort there uh, beyond just the subsidy that allowed them to make the transition. Um, and I don't think that they hold this title anymore, but you know, a fun anecdote about this is that the number one uh, seller of EVs in Quebec was a Chevy dealership about an hour and a half east of Montreal. So sort of in between uh, both like an hour and a half from all of the major cities in the province, Montreal, Quebec City, and Sherbrooke. Uh, and so they were selling a tremendous amount of Chevy, Chevy Bolts. People in Quebec love trucks as well. That's not so different from Vermont. So I do think that the Lightning will be very popular. But I, I think that that having the infrastructure was really essential and having a trusted partner like the, the provincial utility, being able to build that out in advance. And we've brought her to speak um, before, but the executive director of Electric Circuit has a lot to share as well about public private partnership made their expansion possible. Um, they had a, an agreement with uh, Kushta, which is now owned by Circle K, which is ultimately owned by Irving, uh, to install a charging station at a number of their locations across the province and every community. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but many communities have a Kushta, at least, even if they don't have a, a you know, supermarket or something like that. So that that allowed for rapid expansion in terms of ownership and actually finding a place to put this. It's great. Jane, um, did you get the question from Joe Sigali? I'm just looking at the list here. I want to make sure we. I think Michael um, picked up on that one okay. before and started to speak to that. But that was the question that was about transportation strategies were funded and have the greenhouse gas impacts of those investments been tracked. 
that actually, I, I'm not sure if you did answer that second part of the question, if you tra have tracked, and, and Joe, I know he's part of our the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee and works for the Agency of Transportation, and we're thinking a lot about you know, we give, um, we speak to reducing vehicle miles traveled through and the emissions benefits of that through compact settlement and beyond. But we are looking um, right now, AOT is looking to quantify those emissions benefits. Um, curious if you've done any of that tracking or studies in Quebec or um, any other kinds of investments outside of um, EVs specifically. Yeah, um, the studies that I'm most familiar with um, are a little bit more at the macro level um, since I I am not a specific expert in transportation. Um, so the studies I'm most familiar with are at the macro level where this is, of course, tracked as an overall decline in provincial emissions from transportation. I am happy to continue that conversation as well and see exactly how the the MTQ, which is our Ministry of Transportation, in conjunction both with, which I'd be curious about, um, both with the Ministry of Environment, but also how WCI Inc. as a service has assisted the province in tracking its admissions. That has been, that is the number one hurdle, um, and I'm sure James could speak to that in terms of TCI, is getting an accurate measure of your emissions and continuing to be able to update it. And so WCI Inc. does provide those services. Um, on a consistent basis, does it for Nova Scotia, which has a lower, um, you know, smaller administration to be able to manage and track this. So, um, yeah, both of those, I did sort of a combined effort in order to get that information, and we can certainly try to get you a little bit more detailed uh, info on that as well. Great. Um, Kashka Orlo, who is part of our Just Transition subcommittee, as well as sits in on our Science and Data subcommittee, is asking, can you speak to what happens in the event that the grid goes down and cities are left without power? What kind of safeguards are in place at this time? For transportation specifically, I wonder if that's the... Yeah. Yeah, so for most vehicles um, in use, and if there's a user of an electric vehicle on the line, I'm sure they, they could speak to this as well. You typically do leave it plugged in, and it spends a lot of time in your driveway or in your garage. Um, and so you may have, if when the grid goes down, which does happen and there's a power outage, you are likely to have a battery already in the vehicle that's that's going to be filled up for you to be able to get to where you need to go. Uh, there are also companies, including one that uh, I know with uh, the Northeast Clean Energy Council here is a membership association that does work with Renewable Energy Vermont. I think it's called NLX that is sort of like AAA for EVs that can bring you a filled up. I, I think this is how it works. That can bring you a filled up battery to replace if you don't have access to power. I'm not 100% sure if that's exactly how the technology works, but I know that there's an increasing ecosystem around that. Uh, another company where this is a real challenge um, is Demers Ambulances, which has created the world's first electric ambulance. Obviously, if the grid goes down, we need to make sure that that ambulance can still get out and get to people and bring them to the hospital. Since they are typically going to be charging at a hospital, which is on a secure network, that's kind of how they get around that issue. If it's out in in um, in on the road and doing a route, uh, they typically will have a, a replacement back at the hospital or its docking location so that they can quickly um, quickly transition that. So there are safeguards in place at that level. And then the batteries itself, um, and I forget who asked that question, but there is, uh, and as you've seen in the marketing from, from Ford and the Lightning, there is a reverse application as well, um, where the vehicle battery itself could be used actually to power um, your home, to keep the lights on, keep at least the fridge on, um, things like that, because the battery itself will be storing the electricity. I hope that answers uh, where you were hoping to go with that question. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. I would, hey, James, do you have anything to add to yeah, that? I would just briefly add something to be mindful of that this is it's not a unique challenge for electric vehicles. Most gas stations, if not all, I think 
rely on electricity to operate their pumps. So um, filling up is also uh, with with uh, petroleum based fuels is also not necessarily straightforward during a widespread blackout. Just something to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you everyone. I, I don't see any other questions right now in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any, I don't see any hands up either, so. No, I don't see I don't see any questions. I don't see any hands up. Any other questions for our panelists? Presenters? Just give me a second to check all my little heads here. Nope. OK. Um, all right, uh, so I think that's going to bring us to the end of our presentations today. Um, I want to thank our presenters, uh, Michael, James, Megan, and Colin. I also want to thank um, Jane for jumping in to um, facilitate the, the q and I'd also like to um, thank um, Jessica Poulin. Uh, she was the former Vermont Clean, Clean Cities intern, um, and I kept her on um, before she starts her next job at Local Motion to help on the back end with this webinar. So thank you, Jessica. Um, thank you all for attending, and I appreciate the support of the Climate Council um, on this presentation um, and hope that we can move forward on some great solutions for Vermont. Thank you all, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Peggy. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and Thanks, happy everybody. to circle up with that information as needed. Keep it circulating. Yep, happy to follow up if there are questions. Thank you. We'll go ahead and send a recording and um, a link to the PDF slides um, to registrants. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.